The first question says that Jasmine buys his family holiday to India. Here is some information about the cost. So they've given us the cost for flights, hotel, and the total cost. It says in October, Jasmine pays a deposit of 12% of the total cost. She pays the rest of the total cost in December. Calculate the amount she pays in December. So the amount in December is going to be the total cost, which is 2250 minus the 12% she pays in October. So 12% of 2250 which is going to be 2250 minus 270. And that's going to give us $1,980. Find the ratio of the cost of flights to cost of hotel. So cost of flights are given as 700 and cost of hotels are 1550 700 ratio 1550 you can cancel out the zeros so it becomes 70 ratio 155 both come in the five times tables so five times 14 is 70 and five times 31 is 155 so 14 is to 31 is your ratio in its simplest form. This is Jasmine changes $350 into rupees. The exchange rate is given as $1 equals to 71.6 rupees. On holiday, she spends 19,500 rupees. She changes the rest back to dollars at the same exchange rate. Calculate the amount she receives, giving your answer correct to the nearest cent. So firstly, let's convert the $350 into rupees. So that will be money in rupees is going to be 350 times 71.6 because if $1 equals to 71.6 rupees, $350 would be 350 times 71.6, which is going to equal to 25,060 rupees. Now she spends 19,500. So remaining money would be the difference of 25,060 and 19,500, which will give us 5,560 rupees. Then it says, she changes the rest back to dollars at the same exchange rate, which means we're going to change the 5,560 into dollars. So if $1 is equal to 71.6 rupees, that means one rupee is going to be equal to one over 71.6 dollars. So for 5,560, we will multiply this by 71.6. And that will give us $77.65. That is the amount of money she receives. Now it says closes. Now it says give your answer correct to the nearest cent. That's why we gave it correct to two decimal places because $1 equals to 100 cents. Part C says the table shows the number of tourists and the total tourist spending for some countries in 2016. Calculate how many more tourists visited India than Kenya in 2016. So let's highlight the tourist part for India and Kenya. So we will subtract the two. 1.46 times 10 to the power of 7 minus 1.27 times 10 to the power of 6. So I'm going to take 10 to the power of 6 common. So that's going to leave me with 1.46 times 10 minus 1.27, which is basically going to equal to 10 to the power of 6 times 13.33. If 
we have to give the answer in standard form. So it's going to be 1.333 times 10 to the power of 7. We move the decimal one place to the left because in standard form, your decimal should come after the first digit. And the first digit has to be a non-zero digit. So it becomes 1.333. And since we move the decimal one place to the left, so we add one to the power. So 1.333 times 10 to the power of seven. Then it says calculate the average amount spent per tourist in China in 2016, giving your answer correct to the nearest dollar. So in 2016, the average amount spent per tourist would be your number of tourists divided by the total spending dollars. That's going to be your total spending dollars divided by the number of tourists. So 4.44 times 10 to the power of 10 divided by 5.93 times 10 to the power of 7. The reason why we're dividing the total spending dollars by the number of students is because it says calculate the average amount spent per tourist. So we need to find the amount spent by one tourist in China in 2016. So when we divide the two, 4.44 divided by 5.93 is 0 0.7487 and 10 to the power of 10 divided by 10 to the power of 7 is 10 to the power of 3 because we subtract the powers. In the previous case, we added the powers because you were multiplying similar bases. So we move the decimal one place to the right. As we said, the first digit has to be a non-zero digit. So 7.49 times 10 to the power of 2. The reason why it's 10 to the power of 2 is because we move the decimal one place to the right-hand side now. So now we subtract one from it. In the previous case, we moved the decimal one place to the left side. So we added one to the power. From 2014-2016, the total amount spent by tourists in Madagascar increased by 23.5%. Calculate the amount spent by tourists in Madagascar in 2014. So it's increasing by 23.5%, which means your to amount in 2016, amount in 2016 is basically 123.5%. 5% of amount in 2014. Because obviously there's a 100% of entire amount that exists in 2014. And if that amount is increased by 23.5%, that means the total percentage of the amount now becomes 123.5%. So we're going to put the amount in 2016, which was given as 9.13 times 10 to the power of 5 equal to 123.5 over 100 times x. I'm going to call this x. So that's going to be 9.13 times 10 to the power of 5 times 1000 divided by 123.5 equals to x. And that will give you 7.39 times 10 to the power of 5 dollars as your amount spent by tourists in 2014. Question 2 says the pie chart summarizes the ages of people at a science fair. Write on the model class. Model class is your highest frequency. So over here, if you look at the pie chart, the biggest angle is basically showing the biggest frequency. And that is 16 to 20. That is your model class. Then it says there were 90 people aged over 30 at the science fair. Calculate the number of people aged 16 to 20. So we know the angle for people over 30 is 54. So what we'll do is we'll use this angle and make an equation where number of people 
over 30 equals to angle of 30, which is 54, divided by total angle of the pie chart, which is 360, times total people. So that's going to be 90 equals to 54 over 360 times x. Once again, this is this. So we'll do 90 times 360 over 54 equals to x. And that is going to give us 600. So this is the total number of people. Now to find the number of people aged 16 to 20. For 16 to 20, we will do 144 over 360. 144 was the angle of people from 16 to 20, the pie chart. And multiply this fraction to the total number of people, which is 600. And that's going to give us 240. So 240 people basically are aged 16 to 20. In the next question, it says that 250 students enter a science competition. The table summarizes their scores. They want us to complete the histogram to represent this data. So in a histogram, we know that the y-axis uses the frequency density value. And frequency density has the formula of frequency over class width. So we need to find the frequency density of this, 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 and this interval. So for the first interval, your frequency density would be 36 divided by 40. Class width is basically your difference of the maximum and minimum value of the interval for that specific range. So 36 divided by 40 is going to be 0 0.9. Then for the second frequency density, that's going to be 48 divided by 20, which is equal to 2.4. Then we have 64 divided by 10 is equal to 6.4. And lastly, 42 over 20 is going to equal to 2.1. So now what we're going to do is we're going to plot these. So for the first one, it's 0 0.9. So that's going to come. Exactly. Wait. This, then for two point four. Then for 6.4. And lastly, 2.1. That is your histogram. Then says students who scored 75 or more are awarded as dis a distinction. Find an estimate for the percentage of the 250 students who were awarded a distinction. So 75 or more is going to come in these intervals. But as you can see, this is from 70 to 80. We need from 75 or more. That means we will divide 60 by 2 and that's going to be 30. We have the number of people who come in this interval. And since it says it's an estimate, so we can make this estimate by dividing the total num the total frequency into two equal parts, where the first 30 go from 70 to 75, and the second 30 go from 75 to 80. So now the total people who are getting a distinction are going to be 30 plus 42, which is going to be 72, 
and they want us to find the percentage. So 72 over the row of students, which is 250 times the 100, which is going to give us 28.8%. So 28.8% of the students will get a distinction because they scored 75 or more. Question three says the complete the table for y equals to x cube over two minus three x minus one. So I'm going to substitute x with negative three. And that will give us negative 27 over two plus nine minus one, which equals to negative 5.5 .5 in decimals. Now they want us to plot these points on the grid below. So let's plot these points. So first one is negative three and negative 5.5. .5. That's going to come over here. Then negative two and one. That's going to come over here. Then negative one and 1.5. Zero, negative one. One, negative 3.5. And two, negative three. Lastly, three, three point five. These are the points. So let's connect the points now. So this is our graph. Next part says use your graph to explain why x cubed minus 6x minus 2 equals to 6 has only one solution. So x cubed minus 6x minus 2 equals to 6. So let's rearrange this equation over here that we have. Y equals to x cubed over two minus three x minus one. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna first multiply the entire equation by two to get rid of the fraction. We get two y equals to x cubed minus six x minus two. Now if we compare this equation with this one, we can see that the left hand side we can see that the right hand side equals to 6 over and over here it equals to 2y, which means 2y equals to 6. We're comparing this with this because the other side is equal to each other. That means y would equal to 6 divided by 2 and that is equal to 3. We will draw a line at y equals to 3 on a graph and find the value. So the line will be at y equals to 3, which is over here and as you can see the line y equals to 3 cuts the graph at only one point which shows that there is only one solution which basically what the question was asking us to prove the next part it says that line l passes the point 1 1 and negative 2 negative 1 on the grid draw the line and then work out the gradient of the line Points are 1, 1, negative 2, and negative 1. So negative 2 and negative 1 comes over here. And 1, 1 comes over here.
this is the line and for the gradient we will do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 which will be negative 1 minus 1 over negative 2 minus 1 that equals to negative 2 over negative 3 and that is 2 over 3. Then it says find the x coordinates of the points where the line intersects the curve. So what we're going to do is We're going to mark the intersection points over here. So first is negative two, then we're getting negative 0 0.3. And this is going to be 2.9. So x equals to negative 2, x equals to negative 0 0.3, and x equals to 2.9. These are the x coordinates. Yeah. Question 4 says here are the first three patterns in a sequence made from counters. Pattern 1, pattern 2, and pattern 3 are given. So we have to find the number of counters for pattern 4 and pattern 5. So as you can see, it's increasing by 4, which means the next will be 20 and 24. Then it says find expression in terms of n for the number of counters in pattern n. So whatever the common difference is, which in this case is positive 4, you multiply that to n. That's the first step. So let's assume that the nth term is 4n. Now, if you try to find the first term with 4n, 4 times 1 will give us 4. As the first term over here is given as 8, which means to turn 4 into 8, we will have to do 4n plus 2. So if we, 4n plus 4. So if we add 4 over here, that's going to give us 8. And if you find, let's say, the fourth term, that's going to be 4 times 4 plus 4, which is 16 plus 4, and that is 20. Hence, our nth term is 4n plus 4. Then it says Jamal has 150 counters. He uses these counters to make the largest pattern possible, pattern P. Find the value of P. So we're going to use the same nth term, 4n plus 4. 150 counters is equal to 4p plus 4. Replace n with p because that's the pattern he's trying to identify. 150 minus 4 equals to 4p, which is 146. Then divided by 4, that's going to give us 36. So p value is 36. The fourth term in a different sequence is 26. The sequence is linear and the eighth term is 2. Find the first term of the sequence. So we have 1, 2, 3 terms before 26. So that's going to be 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th term is given as 2. So since it's a linear sequence, that means they have a common difference. So what we can do is we can subtract 2 and 26 and divide that by 4 because the difference will be equally divided between all the four terms over here. So that's going to be 14 over 4. And that's going to give us 24 over 4. And that's going to give us 6. To find the first term, we will do 26 plus 3 times 6 which will be 26 plus 18, and that's going to give us 44. So if we start from 44, 44 minus 6 is going to be 38, 38 minus 6 is going to be 32, and 32 minus 6 is 26, and so on. So first term is 44. Then it says find an expression in terms of n for the nth term. So we know the common difference is 6. 6 is being subtracted. 
So over here, we'll do negative 6 times n. Why negative 6 times n? Because negative 6 is being subtracted from each consecutive term. Whereas in the previous question, 4 was being added to each consecutive term. So n term so far is negative 6 times n. And if you try to find the first term with it, t1, that's going to be negative 6 times 1, which equals to negative 6. Now, obviously, negative 6 does not equal to 44, which means to convert negative 6 into 44, we need to add 50 to this, which will give us 44. So if we use dn equals to negative 6n plus 50 for, let's say, the third term, that's going to be negative 6 times 3 plus 50, which is negative 18 plus 50. And that's going to give us 32. Hence, your nth term for the sequence is negative 6n plus 50. Question 5 says the mass of 4 cards in 3 envelopes is 85 grams. The mass of 2 cards in 5 envelopes is 67 grams. Form a pair of simultaneous equations and solve them to find the mass of 1 card and the mass of 1 envelope. So let's give the cards variable C and envelopes variable E. So we will have 4C plus 3E equals to 85 as the first equation. And then 2C plus 5E as the second equation. Whenever we have a set of simultaneous equations, either we can use the substitution method, or the elimination method. For those who still struggle with understanding substitution and elimination method, I'm going to attach the separate link for that in the description and you can just click on that and like understand in detail how we can use both the methods and when do you think it is suitable to use the substitution or the elimination method. Right now I'm going to use the elimination method over here and for me to be able to use the elimination method I need to first decide which variable I want to eliminate. The variable I want to eliminate is C. So once I've decided the variable that I want to eliminate, I need to see that the coefficients of that variable are equal or not in both the equations. As you can see, C has the coefficient of 4 in the first equation and the coefficient of 2 and the coefficient of 2 in the second equation. Since they're not equal, next step is to make them equal. And they can be made equal by multiplying the second equation by 2. That will give us 4C plus 10E equals to 134. Now, if we compare the first equation and the third equation, we can see that the coefficient of C is equal now. So since the coefficients are equal, we can further move on with the question. But next step we need to do is that you need to see whether the signs are same or not. In this case, 4C is positive and the other 4C is positive. So in order for us to eliminate C, we need to subtract both the equations. Why are we subtracting? Because we want to eliminate C. And since C is positive in both the equations, the only way we can eliminate is by subtracting both the equations. So when you subtract the two, what will happen is that will be 4c minus 4c, 3e minus 10e, and 85 minus 134. So 4c minus 4c is 0, 3e minus 10e is negative 7e, and 85 minus 134 is equal to negative 49. So 7e equals to negative 49. As you can see, the variable C got eliminated. We're just left with variable E now, which is what we were trying to do since the beginning. Cancel out the negative signs. 
and e equals to 49 over 7, which is 7. So mass of 1 in Velop is 7 grams. Now to find the mass of 1 card, we can use either of the equations and substitute the value of e in it to find the value of c. If I pick the first one, 4c plus 3 equals to 85. We will do 4c plus 3 times 7 equals to 85. 4c plus 21 equals to 85. 4c equals to 85 minus 21, which will give us 64. So c will be 64 divided by 4, which is 16. So that is your mass of one card in grams. Factorize x square minus 25. Difference of perfect squares, which is a square minus b square. And that expands to a minus b times a plus b. a is x over here and b is 5 over here because 5 squared is 25. So this would expand to x minus 5 times x plus 5. Rearrange the formula r equals to t over t minus 5 to make t the subject. First, we begin with cross multiplying to get rid of the fraction. So we'll have rt minus 5r equals to 2t. Since we have to make t the subject, we collect the terms with t on one side. So it's going to be rt minus 2t equals to 5r. Now we will take t common from r minus 2. And lastly, divide 5r by r minus 2. As you can see, now the entire equation is in terms of r and t is the subject. So you begin with cross multiplying. Then you expand the bracket. After that, you collect all the terms with t on one side. Then you take t common from the on that side. And then you make t the subject by bringing r minus 2 in the denominator on the right hand side. Let's just express our single fraction in its simplest form. So since we have unlike denominators being subtracted, we'll multiply the first fraction by 2x plus 1. The second fraction by x minus 5. That's going to be 4 times 2x plus 1 over to x plus 1 times x minus 5 minus 3 times x minus 5 over to x plus 1 times x minus 5. Expand the brackets in the numerator. So 4 times 2x is 8x plus 4. Then minus 3x, the minus sign gets to be treated with 3 in the bracket and plus 15. Since the denominator is equal, we can write it as a single fraction. Now we collect the like terms in the numerator. 8x minus 3x is 5x and 4 plus 15 is 19. So we'll have fit 2x plus 1 times x minus 5 in the denominator and 5x plus 19 in the numerator. Next question says, Asma has this fair 8-sided spinner. She spins the spinner once. Find the probability that the score is 6. As you can see, only one of the portions has 6 on it. And there are 8 total portions. Which means the probability of 6 is going to be 1 over 8. Then it says find the probability that the score is not 2. So for not 2, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 portions. That's going to be 5 over 8. Asma spins the spinner twice, find the probability that she scores twos. So the probability of not two was five over eight, which means the probability of two will be three over eight because one minus five over eight is three over eight. Then she says that the spinner is spun twice. Find the probability that she scores twos, like two twos. So it's going to be three over eight 
for the first time when she spins the spinner and then 3 over 8 again for the second time. So when you multiply the two, that gives us 9 over 64. The next question says that Leon has seven red counters, six green counters, and three white counters. He takes two counters at random without replacement. Find the probability that the two counters are the same color. So we'll draw a tree diagram for this. Since we're talking about an object, since we're talking about an event occurring twice, Okay, so that's red, green, white, red, green, white, red, green, white, red, green, and white. So, seven red counters, and in total, we have seven plus six plus three, which is 16 counters. So the probability for the red counter being drawn first is going to be 7 over 16. For green counter, it's going to be 6 over 16. And for the white counter, it's going to be 3 over 16. Now, if we've drawn the red counter in the first try, then the next try, since it's without replacement, so the probability of red counter would be 6 over 15 now. One less red counter and one less total counters because we're not replacing the counters. For green, it will be 6 over 15. For white, it's going to be 3 over 15. As you can see, the total number of counters have changed for green and white, but the counters for green and white themselves remain the same because you haven't drawn a green counter or a white counter. Now, if we draw a green counter in the first attempt, red would be 7 over 15. Green would be... 5 over 15 and white would be 3 over 15. If you draw a white count in the first attempt, red would be 7 over 15, green would be 6 over 15, and white would be 2 over 15. Now it says find the probability that the two counters are the same color. So the two counters are same color, that means we go from red to red or from green to green, or from white to white. So that's going to give us 7 over 16 times 6 over 15 plus 6 over 16 times 5 over 15 plus 3 over 16 times 2 over 15. This is your red, this is green, and this is white. So now your final probability will be 13 over 14. Question 7 says P is the point negative 5, 2. Q is the point 3, 7. And QR is negative 4, 6. Find the points of the midpoint of PQ. So midpoint will be x1 plus x2 over 2, comma y1 plus y2 over 2. x1 is negative 5. x2 is 3 over 2. y1 is 2. Uh, y1 is 2. And y2 is 7 over 2. Which is going to give us negative 2 over 2 and 9 over 2 is negative 1 and 4.5. So it says find the coordinates of R. So we know QR is equal to OR minus OQ. QR is given as negative 4 and 6. OR is what we have to find and OQ is 3, 7. So we'll do negative 4, 6 plus 3, 7. We bring the 3, 7 to the left-hand side, which equals to OR. And that's going to be negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1. 6 plus 7 is 13, which means the coordinates of O, which means the coordinates of R are negative 1 and 13. 
then find the magnitude of QR. Find the magnitude of QR. We will do square root of negative 4 square plus 6 square, which is 16 plus 36. And that is equal to square root of 52, which gives us 7.21 as the magnitude of QR. OACB is a quadrilateral and N is a point on AB. OA is given as A, OB is given as B. OA is equal to twice of BC, which means BC is going to be half of OA, which is basically A over 2. BN is to NA equals to 1 is to 3, which means BN would be 1 fourth of BA and NA would be 3 fourth of BA. So let's establish these things first. Now it's saying find in terms of A and B in its simplest form, AB. So AB would be OB minus OA, which is basically B minus A. That is the first one. Then it says find NC. So for NC, let's connect the line first. This is NC. We know that BC is A over 2. We know that BN is 1 fourth of BA. So we just said that AB is B minus A. So BA would be A minus B. So BN over here would be 1 fourth of A minus B. And NA would be 3 fourth of A minus B. To find BC, to find NC, the root I'm going to use is going to be, I go from N to B and then from B to C. So NC for me is NB plus BC. NB is going to be the opposite of BN is going to be one-fourth of B minus A because we're going in the opposite direction. When you change the direction, the vector remains the same, but the signs change. So one-fourth of A minus B becomes one-fourth of B minus A and BC is A over 2. So that's going to be B minus A plus 2A over 4, which is going to be B plus A over 4. That is NC. Question 8 says that the volume of a cone is 1 over 3 pi r square h and the curved surface area is given as pi r l. The diagram shows a paper cup in the shape of a cone. The diameter of the top of the cup is 7 centimeters. The volume of the cup is 110 centimeter cube. Show that the height of the cup, 8 centimeters, 8.57 correct to two decimal places. So, this is basically our height, which is also identified over here. If this entire length is 7, this part is going to be 3.5. And they have told us that the volume of the cup is 110 centimeter cube. So, using the formula of the volume, what we can do is we can find the height first. So that's going to be 110 equals to one third of pi times 3.5 square times the height, which will give us 1 over 10 times 3 over 3.5 square times pi equals to the height and that will be equal to 8.573. That says correct to two decimal places. So we'll do 
8.57 centimeters. Let's just calculate the slant height length of the, let's just calculate the slant height L centimeters of the cup. So we know that it's making a right angle triangle. This is L, this is H, this is R. So R is 3.5, H is 8.57. So L square will be H square plus R square using Pythagoras because it's a 90 degree angle. So that's going to be 8.57 square plus 3.5 square, 85.69. Then we square it both sides, and L is going to be 9.26 centimeters. Parthesis is the cup is cut along the line OA. It is opened out into a sector of circle with center O and sector angle X. Calculate the value of X. So what you need to remember over here is that this circumference of this circle is going to be equal to the arc length. These two are equal. So 2 pi r is equal to theta over 360 times 2 pi r. This is the first fact that we need to establish. So we know that radius is 3.5 over here. Over here, the radius will be your slant length. That is 9.26. So that's going to be 2 pi times 3.5 equals to x over 360 times 2 pi times 9.26. The reason why the radius is 9.26 for the sector is because this was 9.26, right? So when you open this cone up, so this running length is OA because it's going from the center to the point over here, this and this. So this would be the same in both cases. Hence the radius of the sector is also 9.26. So now when we solve this, we get two pi times 3.5 times 360 over 2 pi times 9.26 and this equals to x. When you plug it in the calculator, what we get is 135.7 degrees for the angle x. Then it says a second paper cup is mathematically similar to the cup with volume 110 centimeter cube. The one plus second cup is 165 centimeter cube. Calculate the diameter of the top of the second cup. So top of the first cup has the diameter of 7. When we have similar shapes and the top of the volume, basically your length of the first shape divided by the length of the second shape whole cubed equals to the volume of the first shape and divided by the volume of the second shape. Over here, the diameter of the first shape is 7. Diameter of the second shape is what we have to find. This cubed equals to volume of the first shape, 110, divided by the volume of the second shape, which is 165. If they were talking about the area or surface area, then you would square the ratio of lengths. So 7 cube is 343 over d2 cube equals to 110 over 165. So we do 343 times 165 divided by 110 equals to d cubed. That's going to give us 514.5. Then you will cube root this will give us 8.01 centimeter. 
that is your diameter of the second shape. Question 9 says, diagram shows an open box in the shape of a cuboid. The height of the box is x centimeters. That means this is x, this is x, and this is x. The width of the box is 5 centimeters more than its height. So this is 5 plus x. This would also be 5 plus x. The top ones would also be 5 plus x. And it says the length of the box is 2 times the width. So 2 times 5 plus x over here. And same for this, this, and this. All of these are 2 times 5 plus x. So width, let's write down the expressions. Width was 5 plus x, and this is twice of 5 plus x. Next it says, the external surface area of the open box is 210 centimeters square. Form an equation in x and show that it simplifies to 4x squared plus 25x minus 80 equals to 0. So we know that from one phase, this was x and this was 2 times x plus 5. Now the base was base was x plus 5 times 2 times x plus 5. And then the side length was x times x plus 5. So since it's an open box, so that means we'll only count the base as one phase. And then we have two of these, one of this, and we have two of these. So surface area is going to be twice of x times 2 times x plus 5 plus x plus 5 times 2 times x plus 5 plus 2 times x times x plus 5. All of this equals to 210. So first it's going to be x times 2, so 2x times x is 2x squared. 2x times 5 is 10x plus x times 2 is 2x plus 10 times x plus 5 plus 2x times x is 2x squared plus 2x times 5, which is 10x. Let's further simplify this. So this is going to be 4x squared plus 20x. Expand these two brackets. That's going to give us 2x squared plus 10x plus 10x plus 50 plus 2x squared plus 10x. For this, you would multiply 2x with x and 5 first, and then 10 with x and 5, which gives us 2x squared plus 10x, plus 10x, plus 50. Now we collect the like terms. So we have 4x squared plus 2x squared plus 2x squared, so that's 8x squared. 20x plus 10x is 30x, then 10x, 40x, and another then 50x. And 50 comes as it is. Now you bring the 210 to the right hand side. So that's 8x squared plus 50x plus 50 minus 210, which will give us negative 160. And as you can see, 8, 50, and 160 all are divisible by 2. So we divide them by 2, and that gives us. 4x squared plus 25x minus 80. And that is exactly what the question wants us to prove. And we have to solve that equation. So since it says give your answers in decimals, correct to two decimal places. So we use the quadratic formula x equals to negative b plus minus square root of 
b square minus 4ac over 2a. a is going to be the coefficient of x square, which is 4. b is the coefficient of x, which is 25. And c is negative 80. That's going to be minus 25 plus minus square root of 25 squared minus 4 times 4 times negative 80 over 2 times 4. Negative, negative 25 plus minus square root of that's 1905 over 8, which will give us minus 25 plus minus square root of 1905 is 43.64. So negative 25 plus 43.64 over 8 equals 2.33, which is our first value. And the other is going to be negative 25 minus 43.64 over 8, which will give us negative 8.58. So these are your x values correct to two decimal places. Let's just calculate the volume of the box. So to calculate the volume of the box, obviously we'll use the positive value of x, which is 2.33, because your length cannot be negative. So volume would be x times x plus 5 times 2 times x plus 5, which will be 2.33 times 2.33 plus 5 times 2 times 2.33 plus 5. That is going to give us 250.38 as our volume. Then it says the box is filled with chocolates. The mass of the chocolates is 250 grams, correct to the nearest 10 grams. And the total mass of the box in chocolates is 262 grams, correct to the nearest gram. Calculate the lower bound of the mass of the box. So mass of the box will be found by subtracting your total mass and your mass of chocolates. Now we know that if we're trying to find the lower bound in subtraction, that means we will subtract lower bound and upper bound. If you're trying to find the lower bound in subtraction, we subtract the upper bound for, from lower bound to get the least value because lower bound represents the least value. If you're trying to find the upper bound, then you would do upper bound minus lower bound. That would give you the greatest value. So since it's the least value, so we find the lower bound of the total mass and upper bound of the mass of chocolates. So we start with total mass. The degree of accuracy is nearest gram. So we divide the degree of accuracy by 2, which gives us 0 0.5 grams. So lower bound would be 262 minus 0 0.5, which is 261.5 grams. Then for your mass of chocolates we will divide the nearest value by 2 so degree of accuracy divided by 2 is going to be 5 grams and upper bound will be 250 plus 5 which is 255 grams so now your upper bound value will be so now your lower bound of mass of the box will be the difference of 261.5 and 255, which will give us 6.5 grams. In question 10, it says that ABCD is a field on horizontal ground. The bearing of B from A is 70. So this is 70. And it says the bearing of D from A is 125, which means 
if you draw the compass over here, bearing of B from A. So all of this is 125. Then it says C is due south of B and due south of D. AD is 290 and BD is 350 meters. Calculate the bearing of D from B. Bearing of D from B. So that's all of this angle. So what can you do is we need to find this tiny pink angle first. Before that, we find this angle over here. So angle B, A, D will be 125 minus 70. And that gives us 55 degrees. So this is 55 degrees. Whenever we have a non-right angle triangle, and they've given us one complete set of angle and length, which is this. And they have given us another length or angle, and they want us to find the angle or length for that, which is the case of this length. So we want to find this angle over here. So to find this angle over here, we will use sine rule. which is going to be 290 over sine of angle B equals to 350 over sine of 55. Actually, let's rewrite angle B as angle ABD. We're trying to find the angle of this triangle. So that's going to be 290 times sine 55 over 350 equals to sine of angle A, B, D. This is going to equal to 0 0.6787. Then we will take sine inverse of this. So sine inverse of 0 0.6787 is the same as is basically angle B, A, B, D. So that's going to give us 42.74 degrees. So this is 42.74. So now to find this angle B over here, you need to remember a property of parallel lines. In parallel lines, alternate angles are equal. So over here, this north of at A is parallel to the north at B. And this AB is acting as a transversal between these two norths. Hence, this 70 is the same as this entire angle. This is also 70 because there are alternate angles. The entire angle above the line AB is the same as the entire angle below the line AB made with the north. So that means to find this pink angle over here, this one, angle D, B, C, we will do 70 minus 42.47, which will give us 27.26. And the bearing would be, of D, from B will basically this entire thing which you've already said. So that's going to be 180 plus 27.26 and that equals to 207.26. This is your final answer. So you start with finding the angles inside the triangle ABD. Using the sign we'll find another angle. And then we use the property of parallel lines to find another angle, which is in the triangle BDC. And then we add that to 180 to find the bearing of B, to find the bearing of D from B.
Then it says the vertical mass is positioned at D and the angle of elevation of the top of the mass from A is 10 degrees. Calculate the angle of elevation of the top of the mass from C. So it's going to be over here. So this is the vertical mass all this T. This is 90 degree angle. This is also 90 degree angle. So if we look at the first triangle, which is triangle T, D, and A. So your angle of elevation from A towards the vertical mass is 10, and this length is given as 290. So we can find the length of the vertical mass using tan of 10 equals to x over 290. That's going to give us 290 times tan of 10, which equals to 51.13 meters. That is your length of the vertical mass dd. Now, if you look at the other triangle, which is TDC, so let's draw that over here. TDC. TD is now found as 51.13. DC, we don't know. We don't know any of the angles, but we need to find this angle basically. So let's start with finding DC from the triangle BDC. Because without that, we cannot really find the angle of elevation from C. So, D, C, B. This length is given us 350. And we found this angle to be 27.20. So we have the adjacent. We have the hypotenuse. We want to find the opposite. Sorry. We have the angle, we have the hypotenuse, and we want to find the opposite. So we will use sine of 27.20 equals to DC over 350. 350 times sine of 27.20 equals to DC. And that will give us 160.31 meters. That is DC over here. So 160.31. So now that we have the length of DC and we have your uh, length of the vertical mass, we can find the angle over here using tangent tan of C equals to 51.13 over 160.31. C will be tan inverse of this. Which will give us angle 17.69 that is the angle of elevation from c towards the